In 1994, Rwanda was experiencing one of the bloodiest genocides in African history. In just 100 days, it was reported that 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus had died in a government-planned slaughter, and millions more had fled the bloodshed. The country of Rwanda lost 30% of its entire population. The average life expectancy was just 21.9 years. Its already meager economy ceased to exist. Its infrastructure was devastated, and all semblance of a social fabric had evaporated. Fast forward to 2022. Although not all streets are paved, they are remarkably clean. Drivers abide by the speed limit, and police never demand bribes. Healthcare is affordable and widely available, and the homicide rate is even lower than in the United States. There are nicely constructed, robust residences, and there is an enabling environment for businesses to thrive. But how is this possible? How was this African nation able to turn its fate around this quickly? What has occurred in Rwanda over the past 30 years is nothing short of a miracle, considering what happened in 1994, coupled with the lack of significant natural resources. Unlike most countries in the region, which have stagnated or become worse almost every metric, including life expectancy, infant mortality, GDP per capita, violent crime, and poverty rates, has dramatically improved. Rwanda went through one of the worst things possible, yet they have rallied together strategically to transcend beyond the bitter adversities of their past to become a dominant figure on the African continent. But how exactly did they get there, and how have they been able to become such a significant economic player? But before that, it's imperative that we go back to where it all began. Join us in our video today as we explore the Rwandan success story and how Rwanda plans to get insanely rich. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the section below. Rwanda is primarily made up of three ethnic groups, Hutus who are the majority, and the Tutsis and Twas who are both minorities. The Hutu and Tutsi populations of Rwanda had been at odds for many years. From the end of World War I until 1962, the area had been governed by Belgian colonial forces. The Hutu, the largest ethnic group in the nation at the time, and the Tutsi, the second largest ethnic group, were divided by colonial policy. Tutsis were regarded by the Belgians as better-looking Africans due to their fair skin, and were thought to be superior to Hutus since they resembled Belgians more. Therefore, Tutsis were selected to rule the Hutus on this basis. Belgians favored Tutsis over Hutus not only in leadership, but in many other areas as well, thus intensifying tensions between the two ethnic groups. The general populace was required to carry identification bearing the Hutu, Tutsi, or Tua. The power disparity between the clans was made worse by the Belgians, which treated Tutsis well while relegating the Hutus to high taxes and unpaid forced labor. Wanting to make the colony more profitable, the Belgians also introduced coffee, which quickly came to dominate the economy and led to even harsher treatment of the Hutus. Rwanda's fight for independence from Belgian domination intensified in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Hutu and Tutsi fighting for control led to violence between the two factions. National independence was achieved between 1959 and 1962 as a result of a revolution, with Hutu leaders gaining power. As the ruling government saw them as threats to Rwanda, many Tutsis were killed or fled the nation. These attacks against the Tutsi helped create the environment for the subsequent genocide 32 years later. Despite this, Rwanda continued economic growth as a result of considerable external aid, attractive trade treaties, and most notably, a significant increase in international coffee prices. With this economic expansion came a tremendous population increase. Rwanda was already the most densely populated African nation, and as a result, land became increasingly scarce, which was a huge issue because the majority of the population primarily ate what they farmed on their land. Additionally, the decline in coffee prices in the late 1980s had a devastating effect on the Rwandan economy, 
much like it does for other countries that grow overly dependent on a single export. As if things weren't bad enough, a severe drought struck Rwanda in 1988 and 1989, which further exacerbated the already severe signs of agricultural soil deterioration caused by overcultivation. The government of Rwanda lacked the resources to intervene and provide assistance since there were too many people to feed and their farmlands had become unproductive due to low coffee prices. The government eventually evolved into a one-party authoritarian regime that was corrupt and ineffective. The Tutsis continued to be subjected to abuse and violence from them. One of Paul Kagame's first memories was of him and his family narrowly escaping death during one of the uprisings against the Tutsis. They eventually escaped Rwanda and settled in southern Uganda with hundreds of thousands of other refugees. While there, Kagame rose through the ranks of the military eventually becoming a senior officer before trying to topple the Ugandan government in a military coup. Later, Kagame joined and subsequently took control of the Rwandan Patriotic Front, a militant group of Tutsi refugees with the aim of returning to their homeland. The Rwandan Patriotic Front was a highly organized, skilled, and experienced military force and the ongoing abuses of the Tutsi human rights in Rwanda made this the ideal time to carry out their plans. Hutu President Habyarimana and the RPF signed a peace agreement to end hostilities after the Rwandan civil war had raged for three years. The accord was criticized by many Hutu extremists, who also persisted in inciting anti-Tutsi hatred. However, the next incident sent the country into the Dark Ages. A plane carrying President Habyarimana and President Cyprian Teriyamura of Burundi was shot down on April 6, 1994. Extremist Hutus attributed the attack to Tutsi insurgents. Tutsi rebels denied it and laid the blame on officials in Habyarimana's administration. Interestingly, the culprits of the attack remain a mystery till this day. Before this, the Rwandan government had been arming militant gangs in secret and tracking down all Tutsi families, and hateful anti-Tutus propaganda had been airing more frequently. The president's plane being shot down served as the trigger for the government's long-planned elimination of the Tutsi population. Massacres were committed between April and July 1994 by both government forces and an armed militia. There was widespread involvement in the Tutsi genocide. The Tutsi people were senselessly murdered. In search of Tutsis to kill, Hutu militia members proceeded from house to house, they erected barriers to stop people and forced them to provide identity cards showing their ethnicity. Additionally, government soldiers and militia members committed widespread acts of rape against Tutsi women and girls. Kagame and the RPF immediately started fighting back, and over the next 100 days, over 800,000 Tutsis were massacred. The killings continued until the RPF had taken control of Kigali, the country's capital. At that time, the damage and killings caused was unfathomable. When the Rwandan sector. Patriotic Front seized power in Rwanda, it was hardly a nation. 77% of all Tutsis had been exterminated, and the remainder had been traumatized for life. In addition, millions of Hutus fled the country out of fear that the RPF would exact revenge. In total, Rwanda lost about a third of its population, Nearly all of the infrastructure had been destroyed, the economy was barely producing anything, and there was still a great deal of social unhappiness. How could you ever restore such a failed state? The international community, who had turned a blind eye to the mayhem all this while, deemed the country to be unsalvageable. Following the incident, the RPF took three actions. The first was the quick formation of a transitional administration led by RPF leaders, a government that was extremely accountable, effective, and designed to combat corruption. The goal was to create a nation devoid of ethnic divisions and to stabilize, correct, unite, and unify it. The second goal was to prohibit further acts of violence by employing the military as police and putting as many of the offenders in jail as was feasible within a nation. 
massive sums of money were poured into Rwanda by the UN and other individual countries. The first year following the conflict saw the provision of almost $700 million in humanitarian aid. This assistance allowed for the reconstruction of the infrastructure, the renovation of the healthcare sector, and the reopening of schools. By 2000, Rwanda's condition had stabilized and was gradually getting better, even though it was still in bad shape. Despite his assertions that he never wanted to enter politics, Kagame was appointed vice president of the interim government when the current president was forced to resign. He was also in charge of the national army. Kagame was sworn in as president of the country in 2000. In the same year, Rwanda launched its ambitious development strategy, Vision 2020, which aimed to transform the country into a middle-income country in just two decades. This ambitious development strategy was founded on six main pillars, agriculture, human resources, fast-paced infrastructure development in the private sector, and strong governance. However, the unstated top priority was to prevent another outbreak of violence in the country, even if that required ruling it with a tight grip. With Kagame winning the first election, a new constitution was put into effect by 2003. However, because of certain stipulations in the constitution, Rwanda is not a democratic country. The nation has effectively become a one-party state, and the foundational principles of democracy were never formed. Political opponents are prohibited from competing for office, imprisoned, or even killed. Due to Rwanda's unique historical circumstance, it was imperative for those in authority to build a transparent, effective government free of corruption so that rapid economic development could follow. They succeeded in doing this under Kagame's leadership, and as a result, Rwanda is now the second least corrupt country in Africa, just after Botswana and even ahead of several European countries like Italy and Greece. Even though it is far from flawless, Rwanda's lack of corruption has given them a big edge and produced a positive feedback loop in terms of foreign aid. When aid is given to Rwanda and used properly, other countries are more inclined to keep giving it. Rwanda was quick to adopt Singapore's strategy, and the country that lacked resources began to turn its fate around. When Kagame assumed power, Rwanda's average life expectancy was only 47.2 years, there was poor health care, and the economy was in a mess. Kagame, therefore, concentrated a major portion of funds on enhancing health care. He built modern hospitals and community clinics across the nation. Significant time and money were also invested in training new doctors and nurses, including bringing back medical personnel who left the country in 1994 and incentivizing foreign physicians from around the world to assist in training. As a result of these efforts, life expectancy has climbed to 70 years. Healthcare has grown significantly in terms of both quantity and quality of services. The second strategy for investing in the people of the country was to improve education. To do this, Rwanda has dedicated 30% of its entire budget to education, which is its largest share of government spending. Similar to healthcare, a strong emphasis was placed on teacher training, with aid from humanitarian organizations used to build schools and a 12-year compulsory education program put in place. Today, Rwanda has a 98% enrollment rate in basic education, up from less than 50% in 2000. Additionally, Rwanda has recently shifted its focus to developing technical colleges in the hopes of one day becoming an ICT hub for Africa. However, one of the most crucial elements in Rwanda's success is its police force. Despite being originally ineffective and unreliable, significant improvements made it one of the country's strongest institutions. Officers received more human rights-focused training, and institutions came under the external supervision of seven different governmental and civilian organizations. Subsequently, reforms mandated that the police force cooperate with their communities by frequently communicating their objectives setting up toll-free anonymous phone lines, and actively seeking community input on how to better prevent crime. As a result, Rwanda has some of the lowest crime rates in Africa, 
Rwanda comes in second place for law and order in Africa, according to a Gallup study from 2018. The government was able to enact policies that unlocked Rwanda's economic potential because of the solid foundation it built in the healthcare and educational sectors. The government heavily invested in infrastructure to support growth, including the construction of roads, the installation of major hydropower facilities to finally deliver electricity, and most importantly, the Kigali Airport. Due to its geographic isolation, Rwanda needed to strengthen its ties to the outside world through air travel and commercial exports. The infrastructure for transportation greatly reduced Rwanda's transportation costs, which made exports considerably more competitive. The government has invested in a 2,300-kilometer, $95 million telecommunications network, which has helped Rwanda become the third most internet-connected country in Africa. Rwanda has been extremely fortunate in that the cost of its primary product, the demand and price of coffee, has climbed significantly since 2001. However, Rwanda wanted to diversify its economy and move away from being entirely dependent on the coffee sector. Since 1994, Rwanda has made significant strides in improving its appeal to global investors. Taxes were decreased, export tariffs were lowered, and the procedures for forming a new company and conducting business within a nation were simplified. Unessential rules were eliminated and laws governing the enforcement of corporate contracts were reinforced. According to the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index, Rwanda significantly improved its business climate, going from 142nd place in 2008 to 29th place in 2019. This made Rwanda the nation with the greatest improvement globally. Additionally, Rwanda is becoming much safer, which has contributed to a significant rise in growth across all industries, but particularly in tourism, which is now the country's main source of foreign investment. The country's tourism-related revenue increased from $27 million in 2000 to $635 million in 2019. The fastest-growing industry has been the service sector, which includes tourism as well as banking, retail, hotels, transportation, communication, and other essential services. This sector has contributed to economic diversification and the creation of higher-paying jobs to help the nation's efforts to lower its trade imbalance and advance local manufacturing. The government, through the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, has introduced a Made in Rwanda policy. This is a comprehensive roadmap designed to improve Rwanda's domestic market through value chain development and thereby increase economic competitiveness. Rwanda is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, with an average GDP growth of over 8% since 2000. The ordinary Rwandan is considerably wealthier, healthier, and more educated than ever before. There is no longer a food crisis. Citizens no longer have to worry about crime and violence, but not everything is perfect. Despite its growth, Rwanda is still considered a poor country. 70% of its people still only consume food that they grow themselves, and there are few opportunities for employment. Some people even suspect that the government has manipulated the statistics and speculate that Rwanda has been forcibly stealing resources from the Congo. Additionally, since 2000, Rwanda's economic miracle has been in jeopardy. Although Kagame's strict leadership over the country was necessary to rescue it from collapse, it now seems to be endangering the country's very future. At the rate of economic development in Rwanda, they may be able to achieve the goal of being a middle-income country in 2035 and potentially even a wealthy one in 2050. The real test for Rwanda will come when it inevitably experiences life after Kagame. Should someone less benevolent come into power, the totalitarian nature of the government might easily be manipulated to benefit the elite at the expense of the populace. Rwanda could consider becoming more democratic to safeguard the rights of the citizens. Rwanda is certainly a true Cinderella story, from rags to riches. Today, 
Rwanda is definitely positioning itself as an African powerhouse. It tells us that no matter how bad a country has suffered, economic development is still possible. Many African countries can learn a thing or two from the leadership in Rwanda. That sums up our video for the day. If you enjoyed this video, watch also the next video on your screen which looks at 9 of the most impressive mega projects in Rwanda. Be sure to leave a comment, give the video a like, and subscribe to channel for more insightful future videos.